focuses on uh, my, using Mike 21 c which is uh, kind of a morphological model that DHI produces and uses regularly, um, including myself. So as an overview of today's webinar, my first primary objective is really to introduce you to 21C and then look at applications to lakes, rivers, and reservoirs. Um, and although I'm introducing my 21C, I would say a lot of the elements in my 21C is true of all uh, 2D morphological models. Um, and the general approaches. So first I'll have a little introduction as to what goes into the model, um, how, how it, it um, takes care of looking at hydrodynamics, sediment transport, morphology. And then I've got some example of applications uh, running in the gambit from rivers, reservoirs, um, short-term, long-term scenarios. So Mike 20 c is, is it's a 2D model for fluid geomorphology. That's, that's kind of the short, short and sweet um, description of 21C. And so you've got, you've got your hydrodynamics and you've got your sediment transport. So you're moving sediment around and you're changing the bed and there's feedback into hydrodynamics. And it's been applied in many studies over the past probably 25 years. And, and also over that 25 years, it's gone through a lot of model development. Um, as we've encountered new and different applications. Um, and so the first half will focus on the introducing the model and the second half I'll go through a lot of these examples um, I list below there. So we'll just kind of start of our, our general conceptual approach in my 20 c and it's the morphological cycle. So on the short term, we start with hydrodynamics, your flow in your rivers, your water in your reservoir, your currents. And so we treat those, we have a grid that sets the model domain of where we're looking at in the model. Uh, we can have structures. We also look at um, secondary flow, specifically helical flow effects, which is really in, in, in all truthfulness, it's a 3D flow um, phenomenon, but we've adopted some methods to treat it in the 2D domain. So the hydrodynamics, they feed into sediment transport. And then that sediment transport feeds into changing the bathymetry through erosion and deposition. And that's all dependent on what kind of substrate you have. We also have some scenarios where we can, in a simplified manner, treat bank erosion or also treat kind of outside influences on the bathymetry. For example, someone goes out and puts in a, you know, a large structure that raises the general bathymetry up like a large wheel, weir that's smaller than a, a small structure that would just feed in a hydrodynamic. So we can have that be dynamic over time. Then all of that bathymetry change just feeds back into a hydrodynamics and then you go around again. So that's, that's the conceptual way that this model is set up. And I, I, in most cases for most morphological models, if not all, the conceptual model for those is this. And the differences really just come down to how you're treating things like graded sediment and your sediment transport and other tweaks for special special scenarios. But this is the kind of the general model for most morphological models. And actually whether it be 2D or 1D or 3D, this is kind of the general, general conceptual model for it. So getting more into details of what makes Mike 21C, uh, Mike 21C. First big thing is we use curvilinear grids. And so what that means is instead of a, it's a finite difference model, but instead of using basically squares or rectangles and a rectilinear grid, um, we are allowed to kind of smoothly curve our grids so we can fit, let's say a meander and a bend, and we can have the grid conform to that. Um, to follow the streamlines more closely. And that um, presents a lot of good opportunities for both saving on how large your model domain, how long your grid size need to be to capture a particular river bend. Um, and also probably treats better um, the natural way that the flow will occur in the river aligned with your grid. Uh, we spent a lot of time in 21C um, doing a full parallelization of it and also optimizing 
And the primary goal of that for our, our uses and within DHI and also others' uses is really doing these long-term morphological simulations. So this is an example of, on the left, we have a rectilinear grid, and you can see all these gray areas are wasted cells that, although you're not doing calculations, they still occupy, let's say, data space, and there's still some overhead to dealing with those. Whereas with the curvilinear grid, you're really optimizing your, your grid overlay. So in terms of hydro, so you have your grid, and then the first step is really looking at your hydrodynamics, your flow. And so in hydrodynamics, they can either be fully dynamic, unsteady, uh, you know, having a nice hydrograph go through a flood hydrograph, things like that. Uh, we saw the full set of the San Fernando equations uh, for 2D, so it's depth integrated um, with the San Fernand. And then they're uh, fully dynamic, or there are some options for quasi steady or scaling the fully dynamic um, for long term simulations where you have some special steady boundary conditions occurring. Uh, like I said, it's fully parallel. And then in MIC21C, um, as well as other 2D models that that uh, uh, DHI produces, we, we have a, a Bingham fluid option, uh, which presents kind of a, a simplified approach for, for doing non-Newtonian. There's obviously a large domain of non-Newtonian fluids that aren't matching Bingham fluids, but um, kind of as a first approach, uh, we have a Bingham fluid option in there. Um, one of the things that makes 21C unique in some ways is we have this helical flow from, um, from standard theory, um, which really accounts, and I'll go into it in detail a little bit later, um, really accounts for the 3D effect of flow going around a bend where you're getting these current, these cylindrical currents, uh, helical currents occurring. And it's really a 3D flow effect, but we try to represent that in 2D using some standard approaches. Uh, we also can uh, use a variety of structures, culverts, weirs, and those are all handled as 1D structures. So you start, you're solving your standard 1D equations uh, for those types of, of uh, smaller structures. And it's integrated fully into the model. And it, it's integrated fully into sediment transport and the morphological changes. So you don't have to have some sort of special condition around the structures when you do a morphology model. Um, so these are these are kind of the standard same finite equations that so you're solving for uh, for momentum and then continuity. And you can see down here under my 21 c how that your grid can curve. And so generally what we do is we have a cell center depth that we're solving and then we solve for fluxes um, fluxes through the through the size of our cells. And I won't go into details on, on those um, in today's um, lecture, but it just kind of gives you an example of how, again, you know, our grids concur. So you can solve these fluxes kind of more aligned with the stream flow, the streamlines than you can with a rectilinear. As I mentioned earlier, we have this helical flow effect. So you can imagine if you're going around a bend, and this is the inner bank and the outer bank, you get these you get these cylindrical flow effects that build up, let's say, deposition on the inside of the bend and erosion on the outside of the bend. And so we try to uh, uh, represent that using standard theory. This is a Radzinski, um, Radzinski um, theory, which basically says that kind of the deviation that the flow takes uh, as a function of the flow depth and the curvature, you know, how, how curvature of your of your river bend. And this helical flow feeds into both the hydrodynamics and also the sediment transport for both bed load and suspended load. So we've talked about hydrodynamics, and now I'll move into a review of the sediment transport. So in 21C, which, and also I think this is true of probably most modern 2D, 2D models, uh, we can sediment transport for um, multiple fractions. And we have a special model for cohesive, kind of a standard cohesive model, crone. Um, and then we have non-cohesive sediment that is treated as, as bed load or suspended load or both. 
um, depending on your fraction of size and what do you think is appropriate for your um, situation. Uh, we have a variety of standard formulas um, that we can use for either of those. And you can pick, say, a different one formula for suspended load that's specific for suspended load and then another bed load specific formula if you want. Or you can pick, let's say, a total load and then split them up between the two at a constant ratio. Um, there's a variety of ways to approach it. Um, in addition to the bed load, we also have, um, for the bed load, we also have Wilcock and Crow, which is uh, um, probably a more up-to-date, and uh, I, we've had good success with it, looking at gravel beds and gravel sand mixtures. Um, the only thing I want to point out here, and this is kind of just looking at different sediment transport formula formulations, but if you look down here at this delta S, that's your helical flow effect. So what that means is for the bed load, the direction the bed load moves downstream gets deviated for that secondary flow moving stuff along the bed. So the helical flow comes into the bed load um, transport direction. And then this is that we have a, for all our suspended load, it's, it's um, fully treated with an infection dispersion equation, pretty, pretty standard. Um, but you can see here, these, we have a flux field here. These are two different profiles. So we have a profile in the downstream direction, and then you have a profile concentrations in the cross stream. And that's again due to the secondary flow effects. And that's what you can see here. So you can see your standard profile um, for the water flow here. And this, this is flow, this isn't um, concentration, but so this is flow. So you can see the main flow direction here. And then that drives your concentration profiles as well. Um, and you can see your secondary flow here. So you got, you can see you got your flow going, going this direction and get some flow going over the top in that direction, that kind of circular motion as well as the downstream flow. And then that directly goes into your concentration profiles here, um, where you will have, you know, for the standard one, you kind of have your standard higher concentrations down at the bottom um, and then smaller at the top. But you also get the secondary flow effect. So that will move, you know, deposit sediment at the inside to bend and erode it on the outside um, for the suspended load, as well as the effects for the bed load. Um, and these profile functions, sorry, these profile functions are a function of what we talked about, the helical flow effect, your, your flow depth and, and uh, curvature. Um, and they're also directly affected by the, your bed roughness as well. So there's some accounting for your profiles, um, especially let's say, for example, your, your main velocity profile will change the effect of your, of your bed roughness. So obviously, if, your bed roughness is higher, which is in the case of this blue here. Um, you know, you're getting more drag at the bottom versus versus let's say the purple one, it's less drag. So we got hydrodynamics, we got flow providing a force to move sediment around. And we just went through sediment material eroding, depositing, and in our model domain. So the next thing is that we take that erosion, that difference between erosion and deposition for a given fraction and, for, and then in total for all the fractions, updates our morphology. And so generally updating is done by our X and R equation, um, pretty standard. Um, and we do in the bed, we have a multi-layer, so we can have uh, multiple layers in the bed of of different thicknesses. So you can have, we can all go, uh, you know, one meter of sand and then a half meter of sand and silt, things like that. And that can be set up initially as well and then tracked over time as it erodes and deposits. Um, and in each of those layers, you have a, can have a mixture of different sizes. Um, so as you do this erosion and deposition over time, it dynamically updates. <clears throat> The bathymetry. But in addition to erosion and deposition updating up, um, that should be patterns, not a little extra S there. Um, 
We can also look at some, we have some simplified bank erosion. I'll have an example later on. And it's also possible to directly do some bathymetry modifications. So for example, let's say you have, um, let's say you have a, a, um, a jetty that you know is gonna be built up over time uh, in your model domain. And it's about the, you know, about the size or, or larger than your than your model grid resolution, you can actually say within the model to say, build these sub cells up over time to such and such elevation. And then you'll get the feedback from that into your hydrodynamics, sediment transport morphology. Um, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, but our morphology model uh, is always time true and my twin and C. So there's never any, there's never any scaling. Um, for hydrodynamics, they can be fully dynamic. Um, oops. Or they also can be kind of quasi steady or scaled. And sometimes you, that scaling of the fully dynamic um, is useful, like I said before, in these longer term simulations, um, given that everything's kind of changing gradually and you have some constant um, bed levels downstream, I mean, um, water levels. Um, so as I said before, bathymetry update, um, which is the primary way our bathymetry updates, you have your standard extra equation. Um, basically, you know, what's coming in minus what goes out equals the change in the bed. Um, for this, this N here represents kind of the porosity and the, and the bulk density uh, of your material. And for your different fractions, you can have uh, different bulk densities. Um, so one thing that's simplified in Mike Twain on C versus something that's more adapted for say a marine or estuary environment um, where you have more fines, um, silt and clay sized particles, we don't really have any um, uh, compaction or, or settlement of the bed sediments that's changing the bulk density over time in our model right now. Um, it's kind of something we're looking at so we see, see more and more applications for that for our, our river applications, um, but it's not in there at the moment. So I just got one slide here before I go into the examples. Um, and this is really, sh this is probably a really short slide for a very big topic of calibration validation of your model. You know, basically you can take a model and stick anything you wanted and probably get a result that's one thing or get a result that you want to see another way. But, you know, how do you, how do you have some scientific validity and, and, and quantification of the uncertainty in your model? And it's really kind of going through some sort of calibration and validation process. Um, and all these things are pretty standard to all morphological models. Um, but I just want to kind of give a mention to it that it's, this is kind of important to Although you might not be able for a project to do everything because especially this morphology data like repeated bed sediment sampling and repeated surveys, a lot of times someone's coming to you and asking you a question and they got, maybe they got a, a one gauge of water levels and things like that. And uh, you know, someone took some grab samples one day and that's your concentrated sediment. There's no bed load. And so there's obviously, there's a lot of times in morphology model that there's a lot of, um, best estimates based on limited data. But ideally, these are kind of the things that we would like to see is hydrographs and flow records, water levels, and perhaps ADCP data for the hydrodynamics. Uh, and I'll get some examples of how we can use ADCP data um, later on in examples. Uh, for sediment transport, a big thing, especially for longer term models, uh, is looking at repeated surveys uh, measuring morphologic change because the great thing about repeated surveys is that they represent an integration of all your other boundary conditions that you have. They represent integration of your hydrodynamics, of what your bed load, what your suspended load, what your incoming total load, what grain sizes you have in. So it's a really, it's a really, really useful um, validation calibration point to have these repeated surveys. Um, that also means usually that you, you know, you're looking at a system or someone's looked at the system over a number of years, which may or may not be the case. 
those those are really useful. Um, suspended load and bed load measurements are also can be useful too. Um, suspended load like concentrations, they can be really noisy, and it's, you really need to differentiate between things like wash load of your fines that may just really wash through your system and the suspended load concentration of your sands, uh, which often the, you know, your have your, your coarser source sands that might be suspended load are usually sitting at the bottom or closer to the bottom um, of the water column. And unfortunately, those are sometimes the hardest areas to sample using standard uh, suspended load sampling methods. Um, we have seen some success with using list um, as an approach to looking at suspended load and kind of sussing out grain size and and uh, concentrations, but still there's a lot of noise there. Um, and kind of as a thought, final note, you know, morphological models try to simulate lots of different physical processes. So you have a very complex s system where you have a system with a lot of processes that are always interacting with each other. And we're taking those and we're simplifying it first. And then we're trying to develop a model with a limited sampling of all those processes. And so, you know, I think is it's not like a hydrodynamic model where you got, let's say, you have some water levels and you have some flows. And a lot of times, even for 1D, if it's a nice channel, you can have a really good calibration of that model to your, to your observations. Um, I would say that is definitely the norm is that that is not the same for morphological models. And so oftentimes for doing analysis with morphological models, um, you know, the absolute answer might be, you know, a factor or two or more off, um, let's say for a concentrations or something. Um, and you're happy with that. But usually in, in kind of analysis look at questions, we're looking at relative changes between the models. Um, and that, that generates maybe perhaps a little bit less uncertainty and a little bit more certainty as to what might be going on. So I've got some, so that's kind of a, an overview of what goes into my twin C. And, and I think in general, 2D, uh, more for dynamic models. So I've got some examples here, first for hydrodynamics, excuse me, and then some sediment transport and morphology applications. Um, here is a, for, for hydrodynamics, um, looking at ATCP data, um, and this kind of shows why it's, it's really useful. So this is, this is in uh, Cambodia, and you can see where we have complex junction here, where we got two, two, two incoming flow, <coughs> two flow channels here, and then a you know, bifurcation here as well. It's a complex, complex geometry. And on the left side, we see the ADCP data. And then on the right side, we see our simulated. And you can see we capture pretty well kind of the general trends of where it's higher and lower and diverting and the magnitudes as well. And, and, and this really is, is a consequence of having um, our secondary flow effects uh, in, in the model. But you can see how the ADCP, the, and this was after some calibration of things like bed roughness and some of the some of the parameters that go into the helical flow, um, like eddy viscosity. Um, that really you need usually need to have ADCP data in order to suss out what this proper um, proper value should be. And I've seen plenty of examples where you can get the, let's say, a basic the flow across the cross section and the water levels right. But when you look at the ADCP data, you realize that it's, it's maybe two uniform velocities across the, across the channel, or it's too high in the middle and too low on the outside. And although it produces the same hydrodynamic results and, you know, or very close hydrodynamic results, when you apply that to sediment transport, you can have very different, very different outcomes. So the ADCP data, and it's becoming more and more common that you'll get something, um, especially if you're looking at a very small area, 
you know, a smaller area where it's, it's, uh, it's easy to, to collect a lot of samples um, can be really useful. And also for these complex geometries. Um, this is just another example on the Snake River in, in Idaho. Um, or you can see here we have, have the main flow channel, but then there's a big eddy over here. And you can see I can, we can kind of, the flow goes here and there's some divergence of the flow around here, it produces the eddy. And of course this, this eddy formation here will drop out sediment over on this side. You can see by the bar forming over here. Um, and of course, it's kind of hard to get ACP data over here, but you know you can you can collect you know collect it where you can. So that's just two quick examples of hydrodynamics. And I think most people, if if they're doing river modeling or lake modeling, um, their first introduction is usually hydrodynamics. So I won't have too many examples from that. But this is looking at, at sediment transport and kind of highlighting some of the secondary flow features and other features um, that we've adapted into 21C and, and their outcomes for these specific projects. So the first one's looking at um, kind of a cohesive sediment lens and it's really focusing on that eddy, helical flow, secondary flow effects. And so you can see here, this kind of actually is, is kind of a more estuarine um, environment at a port or a, in a, a port scenario. So there's a port here and you get the flow coming in and out. Um, and you have a sediment lens down at the bottom. And you want to kind of simulate the sediment lens and then from that they would develop um, methods to, to provide limited sedimentation in there. So this is this is a plot. This is this is kind of the entrance to the little port area, this is the main channel. And then I'll show you, um, this is concentrations for, so the lighter up to yellows, reds, on um, the higher concentrations and then blues and greens are lower concentrations. And this here is the discharge hydrograph. It's just, uh, um, just like, you know, just a regular cycle of hydrograph is going up and down. So you can see flow coming in, going this way, flow going out, going this way, up and down. And so that eddy developing there is, is developing, I'll show it again. This high concentrations there end up producing a sediment lens in that area. And it's really taking this, that secondary flow effects and including those that you're able to get um, that eddy feature uh, replicated in terms of sediment transport. Let's show it again. Uh, this is a sample for bank erosion. Um, this is the Songwei River in, um, I think that's Malawi. Yeah, Malawi. Um, so this has a kind of a combination of our morphological model. And then we, we do have a, a bank erosion feature that if, there are a couple different approaches to bank erosion you can take. But one of them that we've applied is that your grid actually moves um, with the channel moving in time. So it follows, the grid will follow the channel through time as the bank erodes. Um, so you can see here, here's the initial channel here. And so you got sediment transport going on in here, a morphologic change. And then we have a bank erosion rate that we've set on the outside um, based on um, other bank er uh, measurement of bank erosion. And the reason that we've used separate uh, rates for the bank erosion is, is, is not a purely fluvial, fluvial process because you have things like pore pressures and um, mass wasting vegetation, other factors in the banks that can, that influence the erosion rate beside, besides the energy produced by um, flow directly against the bank material or you know eroding the toe. But even if it's eroding a toe, then you have to have a mass wasting, which is dependent on the cohesiveness of the material, which is in turn dependent on pore pressures and you know the internal soil moisture in, in the in the bank. So it's uh, kind of more complex than than what my twin C is trying to represent just in the river channel. But also it moves the channel. 
Um, so kind of have a, in a simplified way, we can see kind of if we know the rate, what's the influence on the morphology? So let's, let's see if this plays. Yeah. So the flow is coming around this way and coming along this. It can actually see that the change in bed levels, if I play that again, the make is moving out this way and the blues are lower bed levels. So it's kind of eroding, was eroding out here. And then the reds are depositing on the inside of the bend as well. And not right on the, you know, kind of cusp of the bend, but on the downstream end. And that's again due to the secondary flow effects that transition between outside and inside. Um, a lot of applications of 21C have been done on, on the Danube um, over the years, looking at um, the you know, deposition erosion, point bar development, um, uh, bank protection. So for this one, for example, they're looking at introducing uh, chevrons or um, and, and here, um, you can kind of see these little features here. And these were actually directly, like I was saying, these are directly modifications to the bathymetry um, to divert the flow away in order to cause um, more flow to stay on the outside of the bend to maintain this channel and keep less of the flow in here. <clears throat> Basically what they want to do is fill in this channel or weaken it and enhance the erosion out here so that it would naturally stay open. And you can see here that this is, this is the base case the example and then we introduce these chevrons and the blues are lower velocities. And this and, and what I was talking about before that, probably the most useful thing is actually in relative comparisons between a bait case and, and, your, and your prototype. Um, it's here, this is the relative difference in V. So you can see out here, you get your higher Vs and then the blues are, and the greens are lower Vs in here. So you can see, you know, what is the effect, what's kind of the difference in them. And it does kind of, you know, it does a fairly good job of, of, of achieving that. But it's really looking at those relative differences rather than just saying, what's the velocity out here? Um, that's probably most useful. And you have more confidence than, than, than the absolute values. Um, so that was looking at velocity. So you also looked at bathymetric changes. Um, so you can see here, this is kind of existing navigation where higher bed levels and greens are a little bit lower. Um, this is kind of a more detail for, for the bed levels. And then this is simulated after three years with those, those chevrons in there. And you can see here in the reddish areas that it's built up really, um, almost about four meters um, behind those chevrons. And there's still some buildup out here, but it has enhanced navigation through here. So it's, you know, this says, well, you know, we're achieving some of it, but there's still some issues with, with uh, part of the channel on the side here. Um, one of the long-term projects, and one of the things that really led to my 21C diverting from, from um, kind of other standard approaches for morphological models is looking at braiding in large, uh, large alluvial rivers in, in Bangladesh. Uh, in particular, Jamuna River. So high discharge, you know, is off, you know, we're talking about rivers about 10 kilometers wide that are rapidly moving back and forth. Um, you have fairly uniform grain size of kind of a fine sand. Um, high discharges, you know, 45,000 QMAX, um, so, you know, fairly large. Um, not too terribly high of a slope, but high sediment loads. So it's a big, it's a, it's a wide river, very sandy, pretty uniform, but big, big braided river. And what they want to do is not only represent kind of sand and transport just in a small area, but really get to the heart of the long-term braiding pattern and a dynamic braiding pattern. 
So for the first example, it's not the river itself, but it kind of takes those parameters. Um, but we're talking for an initially a smooth bed. It's almost like a sandbox experiment for the river. You can see here we start from an initially smooth bed. And then we're, all we're doing is introducing a steady flow and a steady sediment load and letting the model do what it wants. And you can see here it starts to develop that instability braiding pattern over time. This is for bed, this is just doing bed load only over 10 years. And you're getting that braiding pattern of islands and pools in between. And not only does it develop by pattern, but that pattern will remain dynamic over time and won't get frozen. And it's kind of another animation. So that was my uh, co-worker, Soren Terry, who's behind a lot of the model development um, and usage of the model um, of Mike21C. Um, he was based in the US and, and is now based in, in uh, Denmark. Um, but he spent a lot of time uh, working in Bangladesh on this particular river. So it's kind of an example of looking at that braiding pattern over time and then looking at examples for the particular river and then looking at um, Landsat variation over time. And you can see kind of how it remains dynamic and you have smaller islands and larger islands developing over time. Because of, you know, in some 2D morphological models that you, you can, you can get a braided pattern to develop from a, from a plane bed, um, the initial state, but it tends to become um, frozen in time. So once you've once you've kind of eroded those channels and built up those islands, there's not a dynamic in the model that will kind of introduce introduce some noise, even to yeah, maybe just say some noise to move that stuff around. Um, and in in twenty one C we have both the helical flow effects to introduce that the three D flow effects to move stuff around. Um, like in the outside of a meander. We also have what we call um, char erosion, um, which is it's a, uh, it's a way to um, modify that secondary erosion um, rate as well, to introduce that little bit of noise um, in the system. And this is just kind of another example looking at the length scale of those, that braiding pattern developing in the plane bed over time and how it is fairly comparable to what we saw see from the Landsat. Um, but moving on from, from the Bridger River patterns, um, as we saw in that first example for chevrons, um, a lot of times with 21C with morphological models, we're looking at what happens if we do dredging or what happens if we put in some sort of structure into rivers. Um, I think that's a lot of the, in my experience, a lot of the applications have been have been along those lines, um, supporting engineering. And so for this example, we have uh, morphological modeling of groins in a particular area. So we have these structures out here, and they wanted to see, in order, and these were developed to the, protect the banks, and they wanted to see, well, does it do it? Does it introduce other problems? So on and so forth. And you can see here, um, you know, with the curve and grid, you can really match along those channels. And although it doesn't show it here, there actually are kind of some, there's some messy grid in here, but because we treat this as um, no flow area, nothing happens in here, um, you know, it's kind of irrelevant to show it. So this is kind of looking after one year 
um, looking at the effects um, of the groins uh, on the pathometry. So on the right, you can see red is where it's depositing and blue is where it's eroding. So you can see that the groins, yeah, they kind of help to protect the sides, but they really, because you're um, compressing the flow down through here, um, it's creating erosion that's resulting in deposition of that eroded material um, nearby downstream where it um, diverges. And so for, for this study in particular, um, they ended up looking at um, several scenarios up to 100 years and, and doing modifications of where these groins were placed um, such that you would try to try to um, try to prevent or, or um, lower the amount of sedimentation you had down here. Uh, this is an ongoing project um, in, in the US in Idaho. Um, which has both some some complex morphology, but it, for this one, I, I think one of the more complex part of it is actually the hydrodynamics. Uh, what you have is a main river channel here, um, but then you have lots all these little blue areas here. And this is looking at the bathymetry or uh, marshes or or small shallow lakes. And they're connected to the channel through little tie channels uh, through the natural dikes. Um, so there's a lot of complex hydraulics. And, and one of the challenges we had was we had water levels. And we had pretty good data for water levels in the channel and water levels in the lakes. And to get the exchange over the hydrographs with the lakes and the channels um, to occur correctly in time uh, was quite challenging. For this project in particular, uh, one of the objectives was looking at lead contamination in the sediment. So the lead's attached to sediment in the bed, um, legacy for, from mining upstream in the 18 to early 1900s. Uh, and this is a super fun site. So what they wanted to do is we're developing the morphologic model to say, in order to address questions of, let's say we dredge here, or let's say we cap it or do this or that. If we make these changes in the bed, what's the consequence for the lead that's in the bed, in the substrate, where does it go? Uh, is the concentration is getting higher? It's preferentially depositioning, depositing in these side marshes, which are important for birds uh, migrating through the area. And so the lead is actually something interesting. We've, we've looked at lead and, and other projects, we've looked at lead and pyrite. Um, so we treat them as size fractions, but because we, we can modify, we can modify and customize their fall velocities, Brain sizes and um, uh, specific gravities. We can kind of treat those in the sediment transport space. If we can treat them as fractions, it's obviously we're not looking at a, more of a water quality where you have dissolved solids. Um, but we can track those on um, that, you know, this lead contaminant, those lead sediments and pyrite sediments through time and look at concentrations in the bed. And because we have multiple layers, look at different levels in the bed uh, over time. And this kind of is some grid detail where we have kind of a fine grid. We can do this with the curvilinear grid, a fine grid um, in the river channel, and then a coarser grid out in the, uh, um, the pond areas. Um, you can kind of see here we have this, this tie channel. So this is connecting to this pond out here. This is the main channel. And then we have a one series of cells here connecting to the channel out there. And actually in this case, for this project, we developed um, a routine where the flow through these cells here is actually treated as a 1D structure. So we can kind of refine the flow um, simulation through those that you wouldn't necessarily get if it was just one cell wide. And that's because if you had, you know, let's say 10 cells across here for that small channel, your grid size would be impossibly small for running this in, in some sort of reasonable amount of time. Um, so that's kind of an example of river applications, uh, sediment transport morphology. In this example, we're looking at, um, we're actually looking at a, a reservoir. Um, and some of the other applications have been in reservoirs, uh, looking at sediment management and reservoirs um, over, over longer periods of time. 
So in this one, we're, we're looking at uh, about 40 years, uh, similarly. And, and for this particular project, we looked at flushing options uh, for the reservoir. And you can see here, this is kind of deposition uh, at some point in time where you have your main reservoir and then you have the um, delta um, depositing out. And then over time, you know, this moves downstream. So it's kind of a simulation of that deposition without any um, flushing. Let's see here, we get this going here. So you can see the building up up here over time. It fills in the bed. And this is the kind of the depth of deposition. Um, for that base case scenario, you know, we kind of plotted out um, deposition of time. And, you know, one of our worries was that obviously with a reservoir, you have a lot of very deep, you have deep water, especially towards the dam itself. Um, so there's probably, you know, there's a lot of 3D effects just in terms of depositing sediment out of the um, profile. So we weren't sure, you know, are we going to capture uh, for this scenario, you know, where we're going to capture how the tow progresses downstream. And you kind of see that that delta moving downstream. Um, but the scaling kind of looks pretty vertical here, but it's not actually that vertical. Um, but we did compare, com, compare it with the Brune and Churchill curves, um, which are empirical methods um, looking that have a variety of data behind it, to looking at um, capacity and years of operation and we watched those, we matched those you know, remarkably well over time um, for the 40 year period, um, which we're really surprised by. But it seems like at least for this reservoir, you know, we're, we're capturing, even though we have these 3D effects that we're not maybe necessarily getting right, but we're capturing the general deposition over time. Um, we also looked at some flushing scenarios where we draw down um, the water at the dam and results in a more river-like scenario here of flush the sediment out and then builds up. Kind of uh, just as I said, a quick example of flushing. You can this is just water depth and you can see it go down and then come back up. And so that's just one year, but we can do that. We can run a scenario where we're doing that, let's say one time every year and looked at timing and things like that. So, so that's kind of an example from and you can see here the results from that flushing resulted in um, erosion of that of that delta, and also you're keeping more of your volume over time. You're matching your sediment, and a lot of times it's all looking at those relative differences um, as well that gives you some more confidence uh, in your results. Um, as your last example here, I just want to bring in something for from the Bingham world uh, for non-Newtonian flow. Um, so there's and oftentimes we've used this um, of late as for, for dam breaches, uh, where perhaps you have mine tailings, um, where they have some non-Atonian characteristics. So there's the dam up here and there's an opening. And then I have overlaid a couple of different Bingham fluids um, with increasing, um, increasing uh, yield strengths. Um, so thicker, thicker material. And you can see over time that, you know, the thicker the material, the higher the yield strength, the, the less distance downstream it, it moves versus this is, you know, the pink and the, and the white. The, the, um, and the blue is, is water. And then, you know, with just 10, for this particular scenario, just 10 pascals for the yield strength is pretty much like water. So this has been useful in looking at, um, you know, floods and using in flood studies from, from dam breaches, um, particularly for, for tailings dams, uh, where you do have that kind of slurry more than a water dam, which usually it's, it's mostly water behind it. So thank you for uh, this kind of brief, brief overview of, very brief of, of Mike Twain C and kind of sediment transform modeling, morphology modeling, 2D in general. 
and then some of the applications for rivers and reservoirs, lakes and, and dam breaches. And I would entertain any questions now if you have them. Great, thanks Ian. Okay, so I got a, um, a partial from Marco. Maybe we can, uh, maybe we'll just unmute Marco. Maybe he can just ask his question. Okay. Yeah. Marco, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you, uh, Ian. It's uh, Marco from Costa Rica Electricity Institute. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Uh, I got a, a question about uh, the reservoir segmentation model. Uh huh. I think you work it uh, with us to do that that, that modeling that the one that you presented already. I think it's from Reventazon Hydropower Project. That that is correct. Yeah, and, and that was from my my time at um, at uh, Golder Associates. But we were using twenty uh, one C to to do that at the time. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're trying to to use uh, the model and also replicate it to other reservoirs. So uh, I got a, a particular question about the uh, Reventazon model. D do you remember how long how how was how long was the computational time for that for that model? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't think it was terribly long. Maybe. A few, I want to say like a few days, maybe at the most. I'd, I'd really have to go back and check, but I, I mean, it, it didn't, I don't think it was, it was, a, it was a more than, it wasn't like a week or something like that. I usually when, when models run that long, I, I remember them. Um, but I think it was only maybe a, a few days at the most. And, and that was a several, that was a couple of years ago. Um, I guess more than five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say we've seen great increases in speed, um, even without improving necessarily how the model's been parallel. We made some tweaks since since the, I think that version, my 20th C might have been, that might have been 2012, and we're into 2019 at the moment. Um, but more increases in, in computing power um, have really improved front times. So. Um, yeah, I, I I think at that time it was probably maybe a maybe a day or so. Um, at, at the time, I'd have to re I'd have to go back and, and check my notes. But um, okay, like okay, that. but for example, for for today's capacities of the software, how much computational time do do we need to run a forty year simulation of of reservoir segmentation in my twenty one C? Um, uh, and one uh, and what uh. What are the computational requirements for that simulation to get uh, well times? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think Joe, we've tested most of our time that we run. Uh, we're using uh, kind of Xeon class processors um, from Intel, and we're running usually with minimum 16 cores. Um, probably more often we're running 18, 20, 24. Um, there's some, depending on how your model's set up and how many fractions you have, it will change whether if you add more cores, if you get uh, if you get better results, kind of the way the model's been been paralyzed. Um, but in general, that's the, those are the kind of machines we're running. And yeah, I have one simulation. It's probably it's about 50 kilometers long. Well, actually, it's longer, bigger than that. Um, it's 50 kilometers long of river, and then we have estuaries, offshore area. We got 17 fractions. Grid sizing is about 100 meters. We run that for we run that for about 30 years, and that takes probably about four days to do. But it's a pretty big. It's a, probably a much bigger area. Uh, 
um, that's probably, that's like 500 square kilometers of river plus probably another 150 square kilometers of estuary and offshore area. Um, so I think for a reservoir, it's, you know, let's say like a couple kilometers wide and 10, 20 kilometers long. Yeah, I mean, depending on your fractions, 40 years, you're probably looking at a couple days, I would say be a good start. It could be it could be faster than that. Yeah. Um, kind of depends also on how dynamic the hydrodynamics you're going to have in the model are in terms of the boundaries. Um, because the more dynamic those boundaries are, um, the lower the time step you're going to have to use, and that can that can obviously chew in. And also your model resolution of your model grid that that can chew into your uh, into your run times. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so I see there's there's a couple other questions on the chat, and maybe I'll just um, I'll just read them out and uh, and answer in turn. Um, so one question is, uh, how does the model do bed elevation evol <laughs> elevation changes um, and mix sand to bed uh, cohesive non cohesive? Um, I guess there's two parts for that. So you know, the erosion and deposition, um, as I talked about before for the sediment transport for, for non-cohesive, you can have bed load or suspended load. And for suspended load, you have advection dispersion. And for bed load, you have the extra equation. But once you have material depositing, um, right now, the way we have it set up is for each of those fractions, you have a bulk density associated with it for when it deposits. So a, 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 a porosity is associated with, with a particular fraction when it deposits. So, and then the net change in the bed elevation will be determined by how much of that sediment you have, um, multi, you know, um, combined with that bulk density to get a, a depth in the particular cell. So oftentimes, you know, the clays will have, will have a little sign at a lower bulk density um, than say, for example, the sands or, or the, um, the gravels. Um, it's a little, I would say it is at this moment, a little basic for, for a mixture. Um, so there's usually there's a little tweaking for your particular scenario as to what you're setting those values. Um, but in terms of how it operates now, that that's how it operates. Um, there's another question about curvilinear um, versus mica fem, which is our uh, uh, unstructured mesh um, 2D model. Uh, it's a finite volume um, approach. You know, curvilinear. As I said at the right near the beginning, it's it's really been developed for these long-term simulations. And you know, flexible meshes really does an amazing job of getting, allowing you to A, quickly create a mesh, and then B, refine those areas that you want more detail in while um, you know, easily leaving other areas at a coarser resolution. Um, however, with the finite volume approach, even with um, the ability to use GPUs, uh, we tend to find for these morphological models that the mic FM, um, it's just, there's a lot of computational uh, overhead or there's, there's more computational effort um, involved. So you have longer run times than you end up doing, end up having with the kind of linear um, approach, especially with starting off with doing finite difference rather than finite volume and also with the amount of um, optimization and parallelization we've done. Um, so I'd say for short-term simulations, let's say you're doing a, a year or something like that um, or, or less or a month or whatever, you know, Mike FM is, is, is fine for that. It's good for that um, as well as curve linear, either one. Um, there's probably the helical flow approach um, and sediment, sediment transport stuff is, is probably it's only in curve linear, but I would say for general applications, you know, Mike FM could definitely be a product for that. But if you're looking at the longer, longer periods, let's say decades, hundred years, something like that, um, you'll just be sitting around a year 
waiting for the MicFM model to finish, unless it's a pretty coarse resolution. Whereas the curvilinear is definitely more adapted for running those length of periods um, in an efficient manner. Um, oh yeah, and then the third question I had was, um, are there any curvilinear sediment transport features um, that are not available in FM versions? Um, probably one thing is probably that the helical flow effect is slightly different. Um, or is is not present in the in the FM versions. I mean, it has it has two D flow, but we have a particular approach for helical flow for um, around bends um, for braided rivers, and maybe that's not as applicable for for say like a reservoir or something. And definitely for braided rivers, we have a special module, special special things to to treat that char module I was talking about. And char is just Bangladeshi for um, for the little islands. Um, that form in the braided river system. Um, that's peculiar to my 21 c it's, it's not an FM, but you know, for for a reservoir, that's probably not as not, not as important. Um, and then there's there's another question um, about. Uh, well, I did one other thing for for the for um, my FM versus um, my 21 c uh, We tr the two models treat. Uh, the multi-layers approach a little bit differently. Um, I think Mike FM coming from the estuarine environment, it does have some, um, it has some approaches in there for, for dealing with um, um, settlement of fines in the bed and the changing bulk density over time. Um, that we're developing in my twin C, but it isn't in there. On the other hand, my 20NC, I think, does a much better job of tracking changes in the bed um, and changing in the sediment in the gradations of different layers in the bed than perhaps uh, than, than Mike FM does. Um, then there's the last question if there's a 3D, 3D version of for the curvilinear platform. Um, yeah, Mike 3 um, uses basically a structured mesh, and, and that's our 3D model. Um, unfortunately, there's there's not a 3D version of my 21C. Although, for for rivers, um, you know, we we have the helical flow effects, which are trying to represent that 3D flow effect on, in the 2D system. And actually, for the um, for that Cordelain model I said that I showed, where we had the marshes and the rivers and they're act acting between each other. Um, we're working and in, internally are developing some um, some more extensive 3D representations in a 2D world um, in 21C beyond that standard approach um, that we showed that I showed you earlier. But there's not a full 3D version. Um, so and and for example, I'm I'm working we're developing a, a, a scope for um, a, another reservoir. Um, not as steep as, as Refenta Zone, it's probably only 25 meters. But for that one, they're, they're trying to retain sediment um, behind this dam. And so we're going to apply 21C for the long term simulations. But then we're going to use MIC 3 and look on kind of like a monthly, monthly time span or a six month time span and to verify that the way we're representing the settlement of the fines. Um, we're going to use Mike 3 to look at the settlement of the fines um, behind the dam in these deeper waters, just to, in a, in a way, calibrate or validate what we're getting in the Mike 21C model. And probably we'll, we'll do the initial Mike 20C, do the Mike 3, and then go back and change the parameters in 21C so that we better match what the 3D model is showing us. Because that's probably, a, that's a truer representation of all the physical processes in that deep water um, going on. So I think that's, that was the only questions that uh, I saw today. Um, okay, well, if, that, if there's no more questions, then I guess we can wrap this up and say thank you everyone for joining us today. And as I mentioned earlier, you will receive the link to this recording later on either today or tomorrow.
Thanks, Barbara. And thank you all for joining the, joining the presentation.